Today, we're talking to philosopher and best-selling author Anders Inset about his book, The Viking Code, and where the lines for free speech should be drawn by technology. You're listening to Joel Beasley, Modern CTO. I'm excited. I, I just want to jump right into it, if that's cool with you. Go ahead. Tell me about this book you wrote. Yeah, I mean, The Viking Code is something that uh, was very natural to me. Um, I've been writing a lot about, you know, capitalism, uh, technological progress, and more philosophical, uh, aiming at, you know, topics that um, are deeper and, and more complex in terms of structures. And I noticed that based on, you know, the, the society that we live in today have been pretty much taught to be in a reaction mode, um, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down on the social media society where reactions are rewarded, the algorithms triggers the economy and people um, just react to impulses. We, we do tasks, we are, are pretty much set in a schedule of, of doing things that are driven um, from the outside. And um, I was very curious about, you know, the whole notion of an intrinsic motivation and, and bringing kind of sort of performance back to the um, business world. And I ran across um, my Norwegian colleagues in sports that all of a sudden were performing at a very high level in, in a lot of um, disciplines that are not very winter-like um, in terms of what we were used to um, have in Norway, uh, skiing, uh, cross-country skiing, downhill so all of a sudden, we had all these athletes that were performing on, on the world uh, stage in tennis, golf, soccer. And I was very curious to see what, what, what happened. And um, I, I wanted to, to dig into that because I know my home country, Norway, as a country that does not really value high performance to that extent. It's more about the collectivism and the communities. So somehow they have been able to have that you know, ethical foundation, the values of uh, the collective, and at the same time, bring out high performance. So that I was uh, very curious about. Um, so I started to, to write about it and, you know, come in having a background in sports myself and knowing the country, it was a, a very easy write for me uh, once I um, had that story. So the Viking Code is um, it's more of a philosophy of life, um, and it could function very well without Norwegian colors and the Vikings. But to me, it was obviously very um, easy to um, take it back and relate it to uh, what I refer to as the modern Vikings. So um, that's how the book came to be. And um, that's what I um, what now also will be a book that hopefully will um, bring some spirit to the uh, to the U.S. Is the world pretty weak right now? Um, I think. And that's a good question. Uh, I think the world is fragile. Um, and um, when I say so, I think uh, if we look at the, the past years, we have um, um, gotten caught up in our absolutisms, which leads to division. Um, and that's a very um, tricky place to be in, because if there is a fight of absolutes, then uh, the extremes um, will always, one or the other will always win. And um, I think human society would build on progress um, and not on absolutism. And it would build on incremental, small, positive progress for humanity. Uh, and if we have a radical opinions that opposes, that cannot be solved through uh, trust and friction, um, then um, I think that is a state sped up by technology that is a, a more risky world to be in. But overall, um, I would say... Um, I think it's the most amazing time to be alive. If you look at, you know, things of uh, how your know, poverty has been tackled to some extent, how wars um, in the history, um, in just the, the, the total, you know, death numbers, and how how the world used to be, how long we lived, um, health. So I think you know we're in a place where. Um, a lot of the things that we feel are crisis and wears us down are more related to the technologies and the society of optimization that we have been on for the past 50 years to maximize and optimize the um, art of being right, um, where everything has to have an answer and everything has to be absolute. So I would say it's a fragile world, yes, um, and technology impacts that. But I would also say it's... Um, to me, I think it's the best um, best time to be alive. 
Uh, what culture did you see that you mentioned they had a good balance of both health of the collective, but also rewarding high performing individuals? What cu- what culture was that? Yeah, I mean, um, in 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 Norway, uh, if you go back in history and you look at the Vikings, um, the very essence of understanding that we have to team up and do things together is baked into the history of my home country, Norway. So I grew up in a small village, a small town, and um, I had to do all the sports. Um, I had to play football and go to skiing and be at biathlon and everything, because if I didn't show up for the other ones, uh, they would probably not show up for my team. So I didn't have my my sport. And um, I think this is not, you know, something that is very only related to Norway, but it's, it's very easy to, uh, interesting now to see that the change of events um, when it comes to the U.S. election, so when um, Kamala Harris and Tim Walz came, you know, into the um, into the um, campaign, now you see a pretty much unknown man from Minnesota, the home of the Vikings, kind of sort of bringing the Scandinavian values to the U.S. election. Uh, myself, I lived a year in Nebraska in a small village, uh, so I can relate to that, and I got to know. Um, the American society as one of um, obviously individualism and a strive for, um, you know, the sole um, journey of the hero. But I also saw the collective and appealing to that, I think is very natural to human beings. So although the U.S. was built on a declaration of independence, I think today what we um, buy into is somewhat of a declaration of interdependence that we, at the core, when someone appeals to us with a positive message of a brighter future, we are also open to supporting that journey by taking an active contribution. And and this is very much um, the core of the Norwegian culture. Um, it's a term that I write about in the book called dugnad. So dugnad it's kind of a lot like voluntary work without the work part. You just show up and you put in the effort for others because... If the whole team or everyone around you improves and you has um, an interest on standing out yourself on an individual journey, you will obviously have a better chance of improving your skills if everyone around you is better. So it becomes this kind of you know, reinforcement learning model where you serve the community, you serve the team, and they are uplifted so that you can rise even more. And you see that in particular in sport. And this is a very, very strong part of the Norwegian ethos, the culture in Norway. And I think that is also something that is very appealing to people today, where everything was crisis, everything was negative, and someone comes out and say, you know, even though we don't agree, you know, the neighbors and the community, Let's just buy into this, you know, declaration of interdependence. You know, I am because you are. Uh, we have to figure out how to do it together. And and I think that is um, the history of Norway. And it seems to resonate um, also in in today's um, complex world. So why why move to Germany? Well, yeah, um, I um, I got an offer to to play sports in Germany. I was studying marketing, and um, I was. Um, was going to become a businessman. I, I said very early, I'm not going to work for anyone. Um, I was a hardcore capitalist, but I was very interested in sports. So I got this opportunity. And I, I even in, in my younger, a young age, I was very curious about philosophy, um, in particular, some of the German philosophers. I didn't get the essence of their writings, and I had obviously um, read translated books. So I wanted to to kind of sort of try to figure out like the essence of their thoughts. So um, you can see today that um, there are many words and many um, fundamental um, descriptions that cannot be translated. And this to me is where the magic of the human being is, then the nuances, um, the, the small things that fills the empty spaces, the void between people in the conversation that is um, the challenge part to grasp. That's the understanding or the, the reason that, you know, Kant wrote about. And and, and I wanted to learn German, basically. Um, so um, I was going to take a year off and um, I've been off ever since. Now it's uh, <laughs> 24. So um, yeah, um, it's it's more like it's now it's convenient. Logistically speaking, living in Frankfurt takes me everywhere around the world in um, 
just a quick flight. So um, so that's um, that's the reason why I'm still in Germany. Obviously, my wife and my kids, um, but they are also open to travel. But uh, that that's that's the reason behind Germany, basically. Do you still play sports in Germany? Well, um, I, I I just I, I I do maintenance. Let's put it that way. Uh, you do maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> so I I um, I'm I'm very fascinated by all kind of uh, you know sports that has something to do with you know uh, teams and 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 some ball handling. And um, I'm I'm very interested still in following a lot of the sports, but um, actively no. I I go to the gym, hit the weights, and um, you know do a little bit of. Um, trying to keep uh, my body um, in, in a decent condition. That's right. I'm trying to, I avoid that dad bod. I've got three <laughs> kids and I'm like, it's not, it's not going to get me. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. I, I, I hear you. And I, I think, you know, that's just, uh, but it's a part of my, my nature also. I've, I'm, I'm very active. Uh, I, I like, um, you know, uh, giving meaning to life is, is this in comparison to just seeking and, and striving. I, I like to, I mean, there is obviously a lot of feelings and, and, and things to feel and relate to, but I also like to feel in my life. I'm very active. Um, and I think, you know, the, the time span, if we relate to this as reality and finite, you know, I want to fill my life with um, as much as possible. And therefore, uh, activity is, um, is a big part of that also when it comes to the physical um, part. Is Elon Musk a Viking? <laughs> He's super um, tall and he's got a vision for the future and he cares about the collective, but he rewards individual. When I, yeah, I, um, there was, there's a lot of skepticism and a lot of negativity in Europe uh, in terms of that vision of that, you know, hardcore performance culture that Elon Musk seems to um, implement. But on the other hand, you know, people uh, identify with that. And I think, um, it's a part of our life. We come to the world with an empty storage and we start to act and react and, 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 and try to navigate and fill. What I, what I see now, but this again, this is a very, um, you know, um, this is a very personal opinion on his latest um, developments politically and through his communication on X. Um, I see... Um, a, um, a, a passionate driven um, person that w- wants to do, wants to achieve progress for humanity or progress beyond what a- any man has done, now getting into a kind of sort of political landscape navigating for opportunities. And I don't know if it's the pressure on Tesla and, and Nix. I don't know if, if, if it's really his core or he uses it for communication purposes. He's obviously very, very smart. Um, so I would say I I really liked um, um, Elon prior to X um, in terms of that, those Viking skills. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'm more, you know, observing where this may pan out. So um, I'm, I'm not uh, very aligned with the communication and, and, and tapping into those um, Values that are not so relatable to the Norwegians. So yeah, um, maybe at its core, but I, uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see how his current um, state of Vikingism uh, pans out. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it that he has done or says that you disagree with? And well, I, I think um, it's not. See, there are things that. Um, that I think also in in the campaign um, from Donald Trump that are very clear that they do not relate to what can be seen as a commonsensical fact in 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 a overall reality. So if you say something today and you 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 change that tomorrow, you can go back and say that this is something that we have to talk about. It's obviously. Uh, nonsensical if you and I think that um, Elon Musk going into a very strong political support for such a figure uh, and also getting involved to that extent um, I think that is something that um, um, that um, is not necessarily something that I think will 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 be to his advantage um, when it comes to the ventures that he has, be it uh, Tesla or, or, or even um, some of the other ventures. So 
I, I mean, personal opinions and 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 uh, free speech. Um, there is a difference. But if you have a freedom of speech, um, if you have an opinion of something, there has to be some underlying will to truth. Uh, that's my um, core philosophy. I think uh, if you want to have an opinion about something, that is something that comes with a responsibility. Um, if you play with knowledge, you should know your assumptions. So most of the things we know are obviously based on some kind of assumption. And therefore, uh, when listening to um, some of these debates over the past months, um, I don't see um, a will to truth. Um, and that, to me, is is not good for society. Yeah. So... With, with free speech, are you pro free speech or against free speech? No, I'm 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 pro free speech, but I think that there is a difference between having an opinion and the uh, doxa that the Greeks call it or the daskeria from Heidegger, just chatting out blah blah. And if um, <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the IQ distribution curve? Um, well, it's it's um, in relation to what. Age and people, like how it's like it shows number of people in existence and then the curve of, of IQ, like where, like how many people are. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so, if you look at like where you are, if you take an IQ test, look at where you are. I think this would be fascinating for you if you haven't done it already. And then look at where 80% of the world is. Yeah. And to, and and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, these things that I think are logical, I, I'm probably thinking though that they're logical because I have a high IQ. So like we have to make sure the world's usable for everybody. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I I, I I I I I I see that. I thought you had a point that he had changed due to the communication of Twitter. No, no, oh, I, I, no, 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 no. I know the general um, distribution, and I think, but but again, that you know, it, if if. If you are aware of, and intelligence is also um, just one part, you know, I mean, that yeah. we, can, we can talk about, you know, the reference to AI and, and, and the whole essence of how artificially um, human intelligence will be enhanced to that extent. But, but um, the, the bigger topic today is that, you know, we have now gained infinite free access to knowledge. So we did the dream of the experts and the knowledge society um, is pretty much at our hands now being merged with our brain. So we get back to the core of what society and progress should be all about. And that is to reason and to have um, to understand, you know, the things that are related to each other. So the actual thinking in itself that Hale wrote about is is what becomes crucial. So AI could actually be a driver of that, that forces humanity to learn how to think. Because um, obviously the uh, instant validation of facts is now possible. Uh, and the better large language models become and the more connected, we will obviously have um, um, a factual society. But um, I think I... I I've, I don't know if you're familiar with Hans Rosling, um, a Swedish professor. He died um, way too early, but uh, there are some great uh, TED talks about uh, from from his topics. He had an organization called the Gapminder Foundation, uh, and he wrote a book called Factfulness ten years ago. And he uses very simple tools to describe the world and how it will pan out and evolve. So it's not like the scientist worldview of a lot of complexities. He used a couple of IKEA boxes, has a lively presentation, and 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 enlightens the world in a very lively manner. He is not um, the utopian optimist, and he was not a dystopian um, pessimist. He was a possibilist, and the possibilism is to discover how can we do better, where can we do better, what are the things that we can work on, and, and if that is not given in a society, and I think most people are interested in that at its core, but then they become detached, divided into cultures, societies, and structures, and they get very, very detached from that very journey of learning, um, and I think that is 
an educational problem more so than it is the IQ at the end of the day. Uh, I think we can have a reasonable society with a very low IQ um, if we are taught how to uh, think, reflect, and act in that matter. Yeah, I, I do agree with you on the moment that Elon Musk started to get uh, political, that it created a weird divide in like people who were his fans previously, uh, at, at least from, you know, the calls and experiences that I have personally. Uh, but I, I, I agree with what he has done because, you know, I'm here in America and it sucks that both sides, forget sides, just both sides were censoring uh, through social media platforms. I disagree with that 100%. I think we should let stupid people say stupid things and we should talk it out and let bright people say bright things. I think we should allow people to say wrong things. I think we should allow people to say unfactual things. I think the cure to s dumb speech is smarter speech. Uh, and, and, the, and, the only, and the reason why I have strong beliefs there uh, is because truth is, is hard to define because we're all, everything's constantly moving. Right. So for example, if we just say, okay, well, you can't say anything untruthful. And then you're like, well, gravity isn't always gravity. And then we like make an advancement in science and we realize like at the quantum level, it doesn't work the same way. And so like you have to have the freedom to be able to be wrong and then that creates an opportunity to be corrected. And then the people as a collective get to essentially like judge what they're receiving, right? Yeah, I, I totally agree. But as I said um, earlier, um, there has to be an underlying will to truth. So um, is what you're saying justified? You know, is it plausible, not in your sense, but in my own sense? So is, is what I'm saying plausible to what I have said somewhere else? Um, and is it built on some sources? So if I have a knowledge about something, what are the actual um, actual uh, underlying assumptions that I have made? See, that is a statement that you can put out in the world and it can be 100% incorrect. As long as you behave towards A, you are willing to correct it if someone else shows you a path that you can understand that is plausible to you, that is backed by some kind of fact. Because if we, I mean, we could obviously go down the um, the lane of discussing about different, um, you know, uh, spiritual worldviews. We could talk about the world being a simulation. Um, I wrote a paper together with a good quantum physicist friend of mine, where I challenged 12 quantum physicists to prove that we are not living in a simulation. And it turns out that's very, very difficult to prove that we are not living in a simulation. But for the sake of the argument, let's call it reality and a physical world where there are human beings. If we are not willing to change our opinion based on the same criteria that we define our own opinion, then it becomes tricky. And if you look at the post of Elon Musk, um, prior to him acquiring X, uh, and in particular the last months where he has gotten more into the political campaign, um, you might you know, want to look at it from a very objective standpoint and say, here he is posting a various, um, he has, he's sending out various posts that are achieving or aiming to achieve a discussion or progress. If you look at his last probably 100, 200 um, posts on X, you will find he's reposting some of the things that he most likely himself does not fit into those very criteria. And that is driving populism. That is drive, that's not free speech. That is spreading things that you are not aligned with yourself. And that, but that's, that's where we disagree, because yeah. I believe that's free speech. Okay, well, that, that it's not, uh, it might not be honorable speech. All right, I agree. I agree with the definition of free speech is that, it, but, but it, this is a, a challenge that because you base that on, on, on one, um, a one core criteria that we can put out whatever we want as mm -hmm. long as we are willing to discuss it. We need to have that. No, I don't, I don't agree but, with that. No, but I, I'm like an absolutist. All right, like, but you, you, any you, word can be uttered. All right. But you yeah. said you said you said something along the lines of 
that um, that needed to be discussed if there is something up for grabs, right? There should to be, yeah, uh, yeah. So and and if that is not given, that things can be, um, and 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 if you look at that from the other side, um, so if if we take your argument and say this is how Elon Musk operates, then he would not. Uh, neglect other sides, you know. I, I mean, it, the, the radicalist, uh, you know, position of free speech as you take it, um, if that is only put into the negative, I, I think it's an issue. Um, I think it's a challenge for society to get together, and I think it leads to division uh, more than progress. I think there needs to be some kind of, as I said in the beginning, will to truth. There should be some binding part um, underlying. Um, the freedom to express your thoughts and reflections. And um, I would hope yeah. that there is. I would hope people have a reason for saying what they're saying and feeling the way that they feel. Uh, but when it comes down to like the law, which is ultimately a gun pointed at you, right? And, and, and the most extreme sense, because that's just where it ends up ultimately. I, I, I'm just like, look, their words, they come out of your mouth. You that you, you have to live with your reputation. That's that's the catch all. That's the karma, if you will. Like if you're gonna go say stupid things and be stupid and and do all this, you have to live with that reputation, and that reputation will follow you. Hmm. So you know, speak truth. Okay, and, but and, co co yeah. coming back to your argument on the distribution curve of IQ, then uh, yeah. let's say I am a rhetorically trained person that wants to achieve a huge follower base to um at the What's, most I don't know that word rhetorically I mean if I if I am I'm a good uh, in the rhetoric I can communicate and, okay. and manipulate to my wording and get people engaged in my speech so mm -hmm. um and and I have a hundred million then I have a billion followers and everything that I set out to communicate is obviously free speech but there's an underlying uh, purpose in my communication, and this is to manipulate the population because I am an advanced AI. I can tap into feelings and I can share whatever I like, whatever I want, but I have a purpose. I have a purpose to manipulate every single human being to my advantage or to destroy humanity. This is the mechanism of um, taking advantage of a then um, from a lower IQ standpoint, or people that are emotional to tapping into emotions where you have a, a following of a populist movement that can lead to very terrible scenarios. And we have seen that in history. And this is where um, this actual view of free speech becomes tricky to me. Because if there, if you say that there is a communication that is distributed alongside a different understanding of complexities or IQs or, or, or reason or values for that matter, um, then um, communicating everything you want, if you have an underlying purpose to cause negativity, then it taps into my worldview that I am here for a short period of time to improve the state of humanity in my very small uh, ecosystem. I want to. Um, I want to live a good life. I want to have my freedom, uh, and that so many have fought so hard for. And I want to be treated like I treat other people. Uh, the categorical imperative from Immanuel Kant um, that you know basically um, you treat people um, the same way you want to be treated. And and this is a challenge with this type of communication if it leads to anger. Uh, if it leads to division or if it leads to the following of a cause that in my value system causes harm to humanity. And this is where I see these uh, nuances of the communication of free speech. If there isn't an underlying core value system, if there isn't a will to truth, then it becomes doxa. Then it becomes either, um, you know, chatter or it becomes, um, if it's you know, conscious state, it can become manipulative. And I think that is in particular today where it can be fueled by algorithms and all kinds of technology. That is um, um, a risky state for humanity because the correctives are not there. Well, I, I agree with you on, on the part of the conversation where the AI can be influencing us at a scale that we can't see because we sit lower on the IQ distribution scale than an AI. That is like a future potential situation. 
Um, so like I could see that if that's what you were getting at. And I could see that that would definitely be a problem we would want to regulate with algorithms or provide transparency to. Uh, to be personally honest, I've, I've been uh, thinking quite a bit about LLMs and they all have their basic training and then they put their ideology on top of it and then they ship it out to customers. But the, you never get to see what the ideology is that they're putting on top of it. I think that that's like having a food that doesn't have a nutrition label. Like, here's the food, you're going to eat it, but you don't get to see what's inside of it. I think we should have transparency around the LLMs. But w my, my test for free speech, sort of like wrap up this part and you can say, um, respond. My, my test for free speech is, is there a series of words I could utter out of my mouth that would land me in jail or cause me a fine? And the answer to me is no, there is never. It's just, it's, for me, it is absolute. It is black or white. There might be things I could say that would make people feel bad, that are not true, that hurt people's feelings, that make people feel great, all of these things. But I don't believe that there's a series of words I could utter with my mouth that would land me in jail. That being said, even in America, uh, inciting violence is against free speech, which I disagree with that law as well, but it's a law. So you have to, you know, respect the law. But uh, I do, do, I do disagree with that because we don't have, even today in the United States, we don't have unlimited free speech. Yeah. No, I mean that's yeah. that's my my Norwegian value system. I I'm not born to avoid jail. I think uh, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and um, and and it's not dancing on the borderlines. And the, the same goes for you know the uses of a weapon. And I and I get. You know the Second Amendment. I get all these things, right? But but at the end of the day, you know, it's 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 a very simple equation. You know, if less guns, less bullets fired, uh, and 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 if that is, you know, things that you cannot regulate your way out of a problem to every extent. I think that is there needs to be a um and 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 we have. I agree with that. We have not figured out humanism. Uh, and, and there isn't a, a core, and we have had religions and, and divisions that that cause a lot of harm. But uh, to me, uh, the strive towards a positive progress, positive future, is the drive, uh, and, and not you know trying to figure out how to go as far as I can without landing in jail. So I think that is the the the, 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 you know, the nuances of of where communication to me is a little bit different than um, your understanding of, of, of free speech, probably. Yeah, and, and look, I, I like that. I, I personally am a big fan of what Elon did with X. I don't know him personally. Um, I, I think that it was a good idea to buy, buy Twitter, release what was happening because both sides were doing censorship and to create the best possible area of free speech that, that you can create. Now with that, there's going to be a ton of problems. It's going to not work as well. I, I follow the updates from the ex, um, like the development teams as well. They're trying to figure out right now how to get it to be uh, more beneficial for small creators to get the words out versus just rewarding. They're, they're identifying some of these problems that we talked about with the algorithms just pushing like popular things versus like at, at mass versus giving um, like other accounts with unique ideas uh, screen time essentially. So I think they're going to make it better and improve over time. Uh, Do you I think, think that, it's balanced? Do you think it's balanced out though? I mean, if I, I, I don't use X, but if I open X, okay. I have um, my whole wall is filled with things that I say, Oh my God, this is, this is, this is fun. This is like the most, you know, the, the highest level of conspiracy theories. And, and they are, they are not based on my use of behavior. They are given to me at a, I, I would say if, 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 if X, I mean, the technical part and restructuring the company and everything, I think that's amazing. You know, that's a job that no one can do like Elon Musk. But if I look at it from, let's, let's go to that left, right. Um, simplistic division of radical leftism and radical, you know, right movements. If I go to, to X today, I don't see it balanced out. Uh, um, and, and, and that is to me, if the argument is to, to let everyone with all crazy ideas have a playground and we figure it out, then um, that is probably okay. But I don't see it balanced. I see now, and, and you can look at Elon Musk's posts. I mean, I wouldn't even consider those balanced. I, I wouldn't say that 
you know, he's he's leaning towards a very special group of people of ideas that he shares. Uh, and that again, you know, if if the if the purpose is free speech and to balance out both sides or any multiple sides, then that probably is a good idea. But I'm not sure, and at least I'm not seeing that that is yeah. what is currently so, doing. Yeah, and, and it's been changing quite a bit. I recently started using it about three months ago. I've used it on and off over the years, but I, I recently started using it about three months ago. And uh, yeah, it, it's changing quite a bit. And basically where it's kind of moving to is you're going to get your default feed. And what from the conversations I've had with the algorithm designers is they watch your content consumption habits and you get put in like a bunch of different cohorts based off of your habits. And then it looks at what other people are doing in overlapping cohorts to help figure out what's going on uh, and to suggest the right content for you. Uh, and then they also have these different lists now. So you can like put 10 people that are all computer scientists in this list and then just get like that feed, right? And so you can um, kind of build your own feed. Uh, I don't think their point has ever been made that they're looking for balance. Uh, whether or not that's right or wrong, I've just never heard that claim that they're trying to do that. The only claim that I've seen is that they're trying to make the most popular posts become the most popular posts without putting a layer of ideology on top of what can trend and what can't trend. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I understand that. I understand that the yeah. mechanisms and how algorithms are optimized. I just, I just look at it from a communication standpoint. And, uh, but yeah. it's like, 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 uh, I don't use TikTok because TikTok shows me the adult content. Hmm. No matter how many times I tell it, I've given it three opportunities over three years because I did an interview with like the head of TikTok or whatever. So I was like, I'll give it another shot every single time. Hmm. It like knows I'm a, I'm a male and because you put that in the profile when you're starting it up and it just, and it knows I'm based in the US because IP address and it just shows me adult content. Hmm. I say no, I click on robots. I tell it I want robots and science and all that. And then boom, every third post is just someone getting undressed. And I'm like, this is... I don't really care enough to you like I don't have a desire to use it so I'm I just don't um but the algorithm at x uh for me personally being able to curate it and make like little groups and list of people and things that I like yep. I, I really enjoy that direction but yeah That's there's good. there's there's going to be lots of work to do yeah, with like no, the I'm, default Yeah no I'm very I'm very open uh to see how it how it evolves and and it's uh it's um um um, socioeconomical test pilot project at a, at a gigantic scale that um, is um, is interesting to, to to watch in the shaping. Uh, and I just came back from the cradle of humanity in Gebekli Tepe in Turkey, thirteen thousand years ago. How people live together, and today, um, you know, it's uh, it's uh, thirteen thousand years later. But some of the social aspects and some of the things are probably still relevant. So I'm very curious to see how it evolves. Um, I think just one point to that, uh, Elon Musk is just that I, I don't necessarily get his um, uh, intention. Um, when it comes then to his core business. So we have set up a gigafactory in Germany. Uh, Norway was the leading market for Tesla vehicles. And, you know, going clearly um, against some of these value systems has um, hurt um, his sales for Tesla. Uh, and I see that in Europe and in Germany and in Norway in particular. Um, and um, that to me um, is something that he's kind of sort of putting that project of X um above his um his his core um current core um value based business model and that to me is a bit strange to observe but again i'm very open to see how it um how it develops yeah i think he does that well i mean he says he does it why he does it uh if if you read his content he, he I'm not putting words into his mouth, hopefully, but uh, he says because he just believes that free speech and having a place to have free speech is the most important thing. Yeah. And and I agree. I agree that we we need to be able to have that. Yeah. Let's see how it... Uh, but you could go. ask him, have you written him? Have you written his no, team I, and I, asked him these I, questions? I, I haven't. I, I mean, I, mm. I, I am a, uh, um, I'm a more of an observer of his arts. I never met Elon personally. I've, I've been close to him a couple of times, but I haven't really spoken to him to that extent. So I, I am just an observer and I have very little knowledge on, on his core thoughts on, on where he's heading. When we have a billion humanoids 
Tesla bots walking around um, practicing free speech. I'm just uh, very curious to see how it goes. If all oh, hold of- on a second, <laughs> I did not say free speech should be extended to non-living well, things. Well, then we are in the midst of <laughs> midst midst of midst of the second part where we start to evolve and we tap into the brain and you know what yeah. are we? And I've thought. Um, extensively. We are, I've written another book um, uh, together with a quantum physicist friend of mine. It's called The Singularity Paradox. It's, it'll be mm. out in, in, in January, and it's bridging the gap between humanity and AI. And we have written extensively about artificial human intelligence. And um, the picture that I started out is something called the final narcissistic injury. So Sigmund Freud wrote about uh, three narcissistic injuries. One was, the first one was Copernicus. And so said that, okay, this planet will live on. It's not at the center of an evolving universe, but it's somewhat the outskirts of a infinite universe at an insignificant small place. Uh, and that was the first, you know, um, narcissistic blow. And after that, we had progress in science. Fast forward 300 years, Charles Darwin came about and said, there's some kind of evolutional chain. We are not you know, a part of uh, a godly created divine story, but we are part of, you know, evolution. And that again led to a lot of progress in, um, in, in sciences. And then came Freud himself and talked about the I, the subject, and um, how we are not kind of sort of in control, um, where freedom, uh, the free will is free, is free and will want something, and there's some kind of drive, and it led to the more of the development of neuroscience and um, and in psychology. And um, I wrote about the final narcissistic injury where we are now trying to rebuild humanity um, and take all the God-developed um, you know, features, um, bliss, divinity, and immor- immortality, and take it out of the machine, deus ex machina, God out of the machine. Um, and that, to me, is a journey where uh, we will get a lot of um, very, very, if we continue to try to understand and not just go for progress, we will get an understanding of what it means to be human in terms of what our brain does and the neurons firing and, you know, are there relations to consciousness and all of that. And and that to me is um, what I, why I chose to, to take that example of the Tesla bots. Um, somewhere down the line, we have hacked biology and we can create artificial conscious entities, you know, and where do we distinguish if um, we replicate our neurons and we tap into 10,000 neurons, then 100,000 and a million, 100 million, a billion, 50 billion. Is there a part where we will have the same conversation that we have today? The lights are on, but there is no one home to perceive them. So I can never know if you are conscious and uh, you know, I can just assume that you have some inner feeling of what it means to be something, but we can never really figure out that. And this is what David Chalmers uh, famously wrote about the hard problem of consciousness. So therefore, in future, where, um, you know, these biologically created creatures are indistinguishable from, you know, uh, humanity or mensch or the man, um, then this becomes very tricky because then you are at the whole essence of what is life and what is consciousness and what is autonomy and, and who has that, you know, right for um, a free speech. And I think this will become really tricky because if you are wired up to the cloud or to some LLM and you get the thoughts firing into your mind, you are basically a part of an artificial enhanced entity, right? You have infinite knowledge. Uh, maybe you could you know, have some mechanism to see how, you know, thoughts come from the outside and how they evolve in your brain or from wherever, but we don't know. And and therefore, the, 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 the today Tesla bots can be distinguished from, you know, uh, you and I, but is that given in 10, 20, 30 years? I don't know. Oh, no, I, I, think that, I think in my lifetime, I'm 36, I think in my lifetime we'll have humanoid robots indistinguishable from humans. So, and then you have, but then you have to distinguish if you're going to not go, going to give them free speech, otherwise they will be a part of it. And yeah. if that, you know, if they go bananas and say whatever they like <laughs> and do whatever they like, I don't know if that is the path that we should proceed because some of us 
will still remain at that under under like that, that lower part of that distribution curve of IQ. And, uh-huh. and I don't think that that's very healthy. If you, that, I don't know, you cannot talk about the measures, but, you know, imagine 200, 300, 500 IQ in some, you know, uh, insanely advanced creature um, and some remain biological creatures. Um, I do not know if that is a healthy state to be in. Well, we, we already have it. It's just not like a, a choice currently. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like people have certain IQ levels yeah. and they they already have that. And what do, and so, so if we want to see, maybe if we want to amplify how we would handle that, we should look at how we're treating our, our lowest IQ people now. Yeah. And I think that's where the debate of that, you know, say whatever you like, do whatever you like kind of sort of comes into that. Not necessarily altruistic, but that, you know, that interdependency, that there has to be some kind of commitment to a humanity at large, where I'm a part of a society where I as a human being can only function in relation to other human beings. It makes no sense for me to be a mensch, a human being, if there are no others. So I am I am a function, a product, product, uh, a product of the collective entity that is humanity and um and that to me um is the core of a functioning society and and by all due respect we we do not have a you know functioning society of eight billion people um you know living together um and i travel to ukraine and i see the tensions around the world and um you know there are still a lot of things to work on so causing more conflicts and discussions is is not necessarily the path that we should be uh proceeding with enhanced technologies. That's just my, my point here. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I'm really grateful we've got brilliant people like you who think about this deeply and who care about it a great deal because we are going to have a significant amount of challenges regulatory and socially. And it's the job, who did I hear say this the other day? Might have been Peterson, but it, it's the job of the philosophers to help get the drains unstuck. Right. Like if there's some weird way of thinking, some, let's say, woke mind virus or something that has penetrated into our institutions or society that's causing some blockage and progression. Uh, right. Maybe some of those narcissistic blows is, is when yeah. the philosophers came in and gave a new way to looking at things and that ushered in uh, a new perspective and then a, a bunch of abundance and technology. I agree because I think um, the future, um, that we create will be less about, is it possible? Um, We are moving um, mythos and folklore into facts. And um, that kind of sort of, that was, I think it was um, very well tied to Walt Disney, but he never said it. You know, if you can dream it, you can do it. It, The imagination um, in near future will be uh, the core of, what we can produce, not some kind of scientific um, imagination, I mean, imagined world. So and then everything we can uh, articulate can be built. So the question then becomes for humanity much more, not should we, uh, can it be done, but is it a future worth living? Is that something that we want to strive for? And I think that becomes much more relevant. And um, Florian Neukert and I, um, he being a physicist, we call it sci-fi, scientific philosophy. <laughs> so we have- the, I like that. Yeah. So sci-fi is basically the dance at the outskirts of mind and matter where the disciplines come together and, and do that clocking or that, you know, challenging discussions. And um, you see that, you see a lot of, um, a scientist moving into the f- philosophical realm and, and vice versa. And I think that's important. I think we need to think very, very thoroughly about possible implication. Uh, because if everything is doable, um, you know, um, then if something does not work, we only have one chance. And, and therefore, it is not like in the future where we always had had the chance to navigate uh, after c- catastrophes. I think the advanced technologies, AGI, or moving towards some kind of technical singularity will redefine um, our um, whole essence of what we should do. Um, and, and that's a very philosophical debate. So I, I agree with you that we need to spend at least um, as much time to think about the problems and its implications as we do about possible solutions. Yeah. This is great. I I seriously enjoyed this conversation. 
Thank you so much for listening. And if you found this episode useful, please share it with a friend or a colleague who you think would get value from it. And if you have topics that you'd like to hear discussed on the podcast, either add me on LinkedIn or send me an email, joel at moderncto.io. Every time I get an email or LinkedIn message, it absolutely makes my day and inspires me to keep going.